And now I said at the start of the show that we've heard a lot about numbers and data uh, in the last few weeks. So let's try and make some sense of some of that. We're joined now by the Chair of Global Public Health at Edinburgh University, Professor Devi Schrider. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming on the programme today. Now, it feels as if the number that the government is talking about an awful lot at the minute is the R number, the rate of infection, uh, and what measures of the lockdown have the biggest impact on that R number. What kind of things do you think the government could be looking at tweaking uh, in relation to R in the coming week? Yes, exactly. R is a really important number because we have to keep it below one. If it goes above one, that basically means we'll see exponential growth in cases again and then likely have to take more drastic measures to get it back beneath one again. And so the measures that are being looked at are, for example, um, trying, since we, it looks like we are below one now, is perhaps you know letting some kind of outdoor activities go ahead, for example, um, you know, looking at schools and how this might affect that that um, face masks now how might that play in even if it's very small as well as the biggest a chunk which might be test trace isolate which is a way of just quarantining those who are carrying the virus instead of quarantining everybody now we've talked quite a lot about uh, schools on the program there have been reports that primary schools could reopen and it feels as if there's some dispute about how much children actually spread uh, coronavirus, uh, whether or not they are uh, big carriers, that they can spread it a lot, even if they haven't got symptoms. What's your understanding on that? Yeah, exactly. I think the consensus is that children are carriers of the virus, because there was a time when we weren't sure could they even carry it. Um, and now the debate is over the degree to which they can infect others. And here, of course, the concern is for teachers, um, for parents, grandparents, basically others they might be exposing if they're, you know, transmitting within a school environment. And so different governments are taking different approaches to this, first based on actually how much risk they want to take and are they going to be err on being more cautious, so you're going to hold back and wait to get more information, um, or do you feel like, you know, we need to get schools back and so, you know, you're seeing countries like Denmark opening schools and then keeping in place monitoring to see how this actually affects further spread. I mean, it also depends where you are in terms of actually your R number. If you have a lot of wiggle room, then actually you can do these kind of, you know, small experiments in a sense to see actually, can we open schools for a limited amount of time? If you have a large number of cases, you don't have proper surveillance in place, you don't have a test trace isolate strategy in place, it's very hard to open schools because actually if you do set up a whole new set of cases, then it's harder to bring that under control again. We've also talked a bit about older people as well. We just heard from uh, Baroness Ros Altman, who was effectively saying it was age discrimination, that people above a certain age uh, should not be uh, allowed to uh, see their friends and family if the rest of the population do. Um, do you agree with that? What, what's your view on it? Yeah, it's a really tricky one because, you know, I really sympathise with you know, the idea of shielding because it can also be seen as locking people away and there has to be a better way of doing this. And so I think what we really need to do is be getting out of the situation where we're trying to, to shield the vulnerable and actually really aggressively go after the virus. This means actually having widespread testing, you know, actually tracing contacts, actually figuring out, you know, through surveillance systems as well of geographically, where is the virus within the country? Because if you are finding that there are certain parts of the country where actually, you know, we have very low numbers of cases or, you know, you have more wiggle room in your R number, then actually there could be ways to actually um, move away from just shielding, um, you know, elderly and vulnerable individuals. I mean, it's also worth noting that while we know at a population level and we're learning more about risk factors or, you know, you know how it relates at, at, at a broad stroke level, we still don't know at the individual level why it is that still people in their 20s and 30s who are healthy, especially in healthcare settings, can get severely ill from this. So these are still, you know, things we need to look at. It's interesting to hear you say there about different parts of the country perhaps having lower levels than others uh, of infection rate. If that is the case, do you think that there is an argument that the lockdown should be eased in different ways in different parts of the country? Well, you know, from the start, a lockdown is a very crude policy instrument to basically delay the spread of the virus. It's like pausing time to build up the necessary public health infrastructure and actually get the virus back into your line of sight to know where it is. And so um, I think what we need to be doing is building local, decentralized, data-driven systems to actually understand what is happening on Sky Scottish islands, what is happening in Cornwall, what is happening in London, and then actually implementing policy interventions that react to those. I think in terms of, you know, lockdown, yes or no, it'll probably won't be like that, like a light switch. It'll probably be easing of restrictions. And, it, you know, I, I would be a supportive of schools going back in areas where actually um, it does seem that there are very low numbers of cases. What you don't want to have happen, and this is the big worry, is that there's a flood of people from an area where there is lockdown to an area where there's none. So from urban to rural areas, um, you know, across, you know, the four nations. And so actually 
at that point, then, you know, there needs to be thought given to actually anticipating that because that's a terrible unintended consequence of a geographic, you know, different policy. Yeah, you say you don't want everyone to be flooding to the Scottish islands to go and have a quick pint on the Isle of Skye if they're able to. Um, just finally, you're talking a lot there about data, uh, and it, it seems that data is going to be a big part of the way out of this uh, through the contact tracing, for example, uh, looking at the R number. Have we been a bit slow on getting that data, getting that testing capacity up and getting the analysis that we need? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think in the UK, we were stuck for quite a long time on does testing matter? You know, what should we be doing? We were also having mixed objectives. Is the strategy to actually stay within NHS capacity and everyone is exposed to this virus? Or was the goal actually just to drive numbers as low as possible and try to keep this and suppress this virus to very low levels? And so I think now what we you know, reach consensus of is that actually the best way out of lockdown is to replace lockdown with test, trace, isolate. But this requires testing, massive testing, about 100 tests for each daily new case. So this means in the UK, if we're seeing, you know, on average, you know, um, you know, we probably would be needing about half a million tests a day. So still a long way to go unless we can get daily new cases down during lockdown. It also means tracing capacity, being able to actually, you know, identify people quickly and figure out the week before who were they in touch with, get in touch with those people, given we know pre-symptomatic transmission is there. And the third piece we haven't heard discussed as much is isolation. How do you actually get people to isolate, whether it's in their homes or whether it's in other facilities, for a certain amount of time, let's say 14 days, to make sure that they pass the period of infectiousness and are not passing it on to others. So yes, we really need to be building all three of these in tandem and having a public conversation of how do we address these? Because they're going to be, it's going to affect everybody's lives. It already has affected everyone's lives, and you know people need to know, understand how this is going to develop. Okay, thank you very much for being on the program. Some really interesting stuff discussed there. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you.